Um, and I want to talk to all of our attendees today. Thank you for being here today. Uh, my name is Olivia Olson. I am the Community Engagement Librarian at the Troy Public Library, and I am honored to have the opportunity to introduce our guest speaker today. Temple Grandin, PhD, is the most accomplished and well-known adult with autism in the world. In 1950, she was diagnosed with autism, and her parents were told she should be institutionalized. She recounts, gro she recounts quote, groping her way from the far side of darkness in her book, Emergence, labeled autistic, a book that stunned the world because until its publication, most professionals and parents assumed that an autism diagnosis was virtually a death sentence to achievement or productivity in life. Dr. Grandin later developed her talents into a successful career as a livestock handling equipment designer, one of very few in the world. She has now designed the facilities in which half the cattle are handled in the United States, consulting for firms such as Burger King, McDonald's, Swift, and others. Dr. Temple Grandin currently works as a professor of animal science at Colorado State University and speaks around the world on both autism and cattle handling. Dr. Grandin's current best-selling book on autism is The Way I See It, a personal look at autism and Asperger's. She also authored Unwritten Rules of Social Relationships, Animals Make Us Human, which we'll be talking about today, Animals in Translation, Thinking in Pictures, and Emergence Labeled Autistic. Now her fascinating life with all its challenges and successes has been brought to the screen with the HBO full-length film Temple Grandin, star starring Claire Danes. Dr. Grandin is a speaker who inspires and motivates others through her story. We are so lucky to have her here today. Welcome, Temple Grandin. Well, it's good to be here virtually. In fact, all my travel has been canceled since March 12th. I'm uh, it's, uh, doing starting my class online tomorrow. So in, a, in fact, we had to put all the classes online in the spring. So that a whole lot of other people. What I want to talk about today, and we can put my first slide up there is uh, animal behavior. And how did being a visual thinker help me in animal behavior? There's the title slide, let's go right to the next slide. And I'm a total visual thinker. Everything I think about is a picture. And when I first started all my work with animals, I thought everybody thought in, in pictures. I didn't know that my thinking was different. One of the things it did is it helped me to understand animals because animals live in a sensory based world. If you want to understand what your dog, your cat, or a horse or a cow is thinking, you've got to get away from language. And then this young boy sent me this picture of how he had old fashioned movie projector inside his head. And the HBO movie shows exactly how I think in pictures. Now, the next slide, I just thought this says that when I was young, I thought everybody thought in pictures. Um, we can go right on to the very next slide that shows some cattle headed right straight into the sun. So the very first work I did with livestock was to look at how time of day, things like shadows would affect animals moving through, uh, moving through a cattle chute. And here's an example of being blinded by the sun. Uh, that can make a big, a big problem. This morning I was on a Zoom conference to Holland and they were having problems with handling pigs. They wouldn't go up this chute. And I go, there's a beam of sunlight right there at the entrance of the chute. They hadn't seen it. And we had some tech difficulties. They had to take the iPhone and hold it up like this uh, to the camera, but I was able to see it. The next slide shows an interesting thing that I saw on our campus that most of the students just ignored. Those are eclipse shadows through a tree. I watched 100 students walk over that. And what's happening is the tree is acting like canal cameras. You want to understand animals, you got to be a good observer. We'll go on to another slide that shows a car through a fence. Cars have a lot of reflections on them. That's the kind of stuff that you've got to be really uh, watchful for. You might want to move that car. The next slide shows a chain hanging down in a chute. Little things that people don't notice, animals notice. And one of the questions I get asked all the time since I do do work with the meat industry, is the cattle know they're gonna get slaughtered? They're more worried about a paper towel just doing this. Paper towel doing that, 
will just about shut down a meat plant. Little things that we tend to not notice, they notice. The next slide shows a cattle shoot where the cattle are coming up to get vaccinated. Picture I took in Australia and they wouldn't go through this shoot because they could see the trucks loading. And when I pointed that out to the people at the feed yard, you can see they got some really big trucks in Australia, it was obvious. The next slide shows problems with getting the animals to go into a dark building. Now this will work really well at night. I can light it up with lights, they'll go right in. But when it's real sunny outside, you get the dark movie theater effect and they don't wanna go in there. The next slide just shows a way that I can fix this by putting in some white translucent panels and letting light get into this building. Lighting's really important. Now the next slide, which shows an umbrella and a tarp brings up a really important thing. An animal's thinking is very specific. Again, it's sensory based. So if you train a horse to tolerate a blue and white umbrella, that's not gonna transfer to a tarp. And my student, Megan Corgan, just finished up a really interesting experiment with horses that she did with a child's plastic playset. You know, it's about you know four foot by four foot square, has a little swing on it, little slide on it, bright colored plastic, and she trained the horse to walk by it a whole bunch of times. But then when that playset was rotated, see it looks different when it's rotated. Let's just take something like this stapler. You see if I hold the stapler like that, that looks totally different than this. And the horse perceived it as something new when it was rotated. And since we tend to think in words, the we would just go, yeah, that's a playset, you know, we wouldn't, it, it, we'd, we'd know what it was, but to the horse, it became new. The next slide just says that sensory-based thinking is, is very specific. Um, I knew a horse that was terrified of black cowboy hats. White cowboy hats were just fine, but black cowboy hats were scary. We can go on to the next slide. Now, for any animal, dog, cat, horse, sudden novelty is scary. A common question I get asked is, my horse was fine at home and we went to the show and he went completely berserk. Well, you got a lot of new things at the show, flags, bikes and balloons, this is all new things. And one of the best ways to get your horse or your show steer or lamb used to these things is to let them voluntarily approach. The next slide shows a bunch of cattle walking up to a clipboard. When you put something novel out there, when the animals are allowed to voluntarily approach, it's interesting. Novelty is scary if you suddenly just shove it in the animal's face. So the best way to get them used to things like flags would be to decorate the pasture with flags and let your animal just voluntarily go up to it. Now there's a really funny video that you can look at online of a, you can type in remote controlled car and cattle into YouTube and when they put the remote control car out on the pasture, at first they run away from it, then they start chasing it. The next slide just says that the brain can go either into like an approach mode or it can go into a fear mode, move away from something. And the mechanisms where the brain does this have actually been found. And that is discussed in my book, um, Animals Make Us Human. Uh, that's discussed. In fact, I do have a copy of it right here. Animals Make Us Human. I wish I'd would sign them for you tonight, but that's not gonna work very well on Zoom. But the brain can either go into fear mode or an approach mode. The next slide shows a big visual thinking circuit in my brain. This was a real mind blower having this brain scan. Found out I got a real big visual thinker, thinking circuit. And then when they took another slice in my head, found out I had an even bigger one. You can look at that on another, the next slide will show that. Uh, and then there's a slide that shows a problem I've got with couldn't do math. Right now, I'm working on a book on uh, visual thinking. I'm a, I'm a visual thinker. And I'm very concerned that some of our, in our educational system, we're screening out our visual thinkers. And we need visual thinking in design work. In fact, right now, I was just looking up the curriculums for engineering and for industrial design. And engineering is almost all math. Industrial design is much more on the art side of things. So when I was a young kid, I absolutely could not do algebra. There was, there's nothing to visualize. If you watch the HBO movie, you can see how I think in pictures. And we need visual thinkers in engineering. We need them. There's two parts of 
of engineering. There's a clever engineering department, thinks in pictures, and then there's the mathematical part. The next slide shows different kinds of thinking, and I'm what's called an object visualizer. Everything I see in my head, it's a picture. Then another kind of person is a mathematical person, the visual spatial pattern mathematical thinking mind. And then you've got people that are the verbal thinkers. Now, when it get, comes to understanding animals, I have found that a lot of people that are verbal thinkers have a hard time understanding how an animal could actually think. And then you've got some people that are auditory thinkers. I had a student that was an auditory thinker. And there's research now that shows that this different kinds of thinking actually exists. And um, since the publication of my book, The Autistic Brain, there's been more research showing that there are two different kinds of, of, of thinking, object visualization and pictures and more pattern, visual, spatial, mathematical thinking. The next slide shows a horse who was terrified of black cowboy hats because during a veterinary procedure, somebody chucked alcohol in his eyes and that guy was wearing a black hat and white cowboy hat, no effect. Now I went and I put the hat down on the ground and when I put the hat down on the ground, it was less scary. But as I brought that hat up to my head, it got more and more and more scary. Now what we got to do with animals is we've got to prevent fear memories from forming. We've got to prevent it. And we want to make sure that when you take the puppy into the veterinarian's office for the first time, that it's a good first experience. If animals have a bad first experience with something, they're going to be afraid. But animals will often associate something they were either hearing or seeing right when a bad thing happens. And they'll get afraid of stuff that might just seem kind of odd, like the black hat. The next slide shows a really calm animal. And if an animal gets really scared, it takes 20 minutes for them to calm down. Um, fortunately, the next slide talks about uh, fear-free methods in veterinary clinics. I mean, uh, veterinarians are beginning to understand that it's really important, you know, for dogs to not come into the vet's office terrified. And oftentimes it's the fear, maybe sliding and slipping around on the slippery floor. That's worse than the pain of getting the shot. Getting the shot just isn't that big a deal. The next slide shows a dog turning gray. This is my friend Camille King. She's a really good scientist. And she did this study. I just helped out on some of the methods. And she noticed in her dog behavior practice that a lot of dogs were turning gray prematurely. Well, and that tended to be dogs that were impulsive. They'd jump on people. Uh, they had difficulties with being home alone and they'd whine because they were home alone. Um, but some dogs are getting really stressed. One thing about COVID, best thing that ever happened to pets. Pets are having a great time, getting lots and lots and lots of walks. Uh, uh, pets think COVID's just wonderful because they're, they're, everybody's home. The next slide just talks about fear. And I can really relate to fear because my, I, when I was younger, I had horrible problems with panic attacks. And um, I, they've actually found the fear center in the brain. Uh, and a lot of uh, problems with things like the horse getting upset at the horse show, that's gonna be fear. Now the next slide just shows that animals can have personality stress, uh, personality differences. A dog that's calm, it's got a bold personality, doesn't get scared easily. It tends to be less vulnerable to getting sick at the animal shelter because it's not getting as scared. Shy, that's just a scientific word for dogs that are high fear. And they tend to have more immune uh, system issues. So the next slide just asks the question, do animals actually have emotions? Now, I've always thought it was kind of ridiculous to ask this question, but I read a lot of neuroscience uh, journals and I'm finding that people are still discussing this. And I think it basically gets down to uh, verbal thinking. People that think completely in words have a hard time that an animal could be conscious the way we are. And yeah, they definitely have emotion. Prozac will work on dogs. Uh, the emotional systems in animal brains and our brains are similar. The next slide shows the Jack Pence gap emotional systems. I really, really like this system. This is neuroscience. These are the things that motivate behavior. You've got fear, fear uh, uh, that motivates an animal to stay away from predators. Then you have anger, 
Then you have separation distress. You leave a dog home alone, and he's eating the house up. Well, of course, during COVID now, everybody's home, so we've got less of that problem. But fear and separation distress are two totally, totally separate things. Then you have the urge to explore, that seek. One dog, all it wants to do is chase the ball. Another dog could care less about the ball. So one's a high seek, the other is a low seek. That's also true in cattle. Um, and then you have the sex drive, you've got the mother young nurturing, and then you've got play. And this is uh, hardcore neuroscience. In the next slide I'd like to show how I like to visualize some of these things. Visualize it sort of like a music mixing board where you have a slot for each emotion and both genetics and previous experiences can set the volume controls in those different slots, especially for fear. And there was in some very interesting research done at New Mexico State showed that some cows were high seek. They'd go out and they graze all kinds of pasture, other cattle, they are lazy and just lay around the water hole. So there's differences in animals' personality. The next slide shows the importance of getting a non-slip floor at the vet clinic. I like to show this slide at veterinary, um, uh, veterinary schools. And I said, well, how many of you noticed that that dog's in the brace position? And uh, he's not having a good time there. Let's get a non-slip mat for the dog to, to stand on. And what you can do is just get a bath mat with a rubber backing that the puppy's used to and bring that in and put it on the table. Something simple. Because when they're slipping, they're panicking. The next slide shows a bunch of dogs that have been trained to go on an MRI scanner. And this is the work of uh, uh, Gregory Burns. And, and when the dog smells his favorite person, the emotion centers light up. You know, they've got emotions. And he spent a lot of time training dogs to lay still in the scanner. And there's some really, really cute videos on YouTube that show how they did this. It's a lot of work training dogs to lay still for 15 minutes. And there's been some interesting things that they've learned that's in this next slide. And that visual associations and olfactory associations are learned really, really quickly compared to verbal learning. Yes, the dog can definitely learn commands, but um, a dog lives in a sensory-based world, lives in a world of smell, and when he's checking out the local tree that everybody yanks him away from, so you let, it, let that dog have some social life and check out that tree. That's like going down to the coffee shop. Now the next slide brings up the whole issue about feeling pain. And yes, animals definitely do feel pain. And what, these ex what this experiment showed is that they actually will self-medicate for pain. And then as the joint heals, they'll uh, stop drinking the bitter substance when the leg gets healed. Yes, they do feel pain. The next slide shows what the dogs really need. This is a study that one of my graduate students did at Animal Shelter, and uh, the controls just got put in a cage when they came in. The uh, experimental dogs, they got to play with Christopher for 45 minutes, and when they were tested for their cortisol the next day, the ones that had that human contact were less stressed. So what this tells you is, is you need to have volunteers come in every day and take dogs out and give them a good time. Dogs need people. We have bred dogs that way and that's what they need. I've got another little cool study here that my friend Camille King did. Uh, do pressure wraps work? Thunder shirts, do they actually work? What they tend to work the best for, and we can go to the next slide, is, uh, is for separation anxiety. I think they work better for separation anxiety than they do for thunder. And they were more likely to work on a dog that's not on anxiety medication. And the thunder shirt uh, reduced the amount of time the dog just stood looking at the door. Now, where did the idea for that thunder shirt come from? Well, it came from my squeezing machine, which is shown in the next slide. When I got into puberty, I started having horrible, horrible panic attacks. And, and I watched cattle going in a cattle squeeze chute I noticed that when they went in the cattle squeeze chute to calm down, so I went and built a squeeze chute for myself. And uh, I built that all myself. I um, had some skilled trade stuff there. And uh, some people on the autism spectrum find deep pressure really calming. Others, it doesn't work. There's a lot of simple ways you can do it, like weighted blankets. And then there's a picture that shows my rear view. You can just show that just briefly. Show my rear view when I wasn't quite as heavy as I am now. Now, 
the, uh, you see, the thing is, a brain can either be more social or a brain can be more thinking. And there's an interesting paper called Solitary Mammals as a Model for Autism. So lions live in groups and they are more social than tigers or leopards. Tigers and leopards are more solitary. Well, does that mean that leopards are defective, need to have a diagnosis? You see, in the milder forms of autism, it's just a normal variation. Now, obviously, if a child never learns to talk, uh, that's, that's a really uh, severe handicap. And then dogs are friendly, and they share some of the same genetics that you have with Williams syndrome. They're finding a lot of these genetic things are um, uh, there in, in other animals, too. We go to the next slide. And dogs, when they, want, when they can't solve a problem, they'll often look to a person to help them get into a box that they can't get into. We've bred dogs to be very, very social. Now this next slide shows a paper that was a real mind blower when I first found this paper. And the paper was genomic trade-offs are autism and schizophrenia the steep price for a human brain. The same genes that give people a great big brain also cause autism and schizophrenia. And they're brain development genes. Building a big brain is a messy thing. And there's a whole lot of, of uh, pieces of genetic code involved. It's not simple. Like you breed black Angus cattle to Hereford and you get the black um, coat, which is dominant. That's simple Mendelian. The next slide just shows some different things that could stress cattle. And one thing that has improved a lot is people have gotten a whole lot better on their cattle handling. And when you handle animals quietly, uh, then you don't get all the stress hormone. So what's going on with the trained antelope down there? Well, we worked on training antelope at the Denver Zoo and nobody thought it'd be possible to train them. And and we train them, and the next slide shows the training of them. We train the antelope to voluntarily cooperate with um, getting vaccinations and getting blood tests. And nobody thought we could do this. A really flighty animal. So we had to go through a long period of very careful desensitization. And, and uh, we trained them. And I'm really proud of that. I can't emphasize enough how important good stockmanship is. That's shown in the next slide. And when you have good stockmanship, you're going to have more productive animals. If animals are afraid of people. You're going to have less productive animals. Um, stockmanship really matters. I have found that people oftentimes want the new thing, fancy new handling facility, new milking parlor or whatever. They want that more than the management. Well, when I was young, I thought I could fix everything with engineering. I found I can fix about half the problems with engineering. And the other half is the management. The next slide emphasizes the importance of the first experience. And I've already discussed that. A first experience was something new, a really horrible first experiences, then I'm, an animal can get a fear memory. And if you have an animal with a flighty nervous temperament, that fear memory can be almost like a PTSD. In fact, there is a paper in the Journal of Animal Science with cattle exposed to wolves, They're kind of getting PTSD from it. And the next slide just shows that if you're going to show a horse something new, he will be calmer if he's got a familiar person with him. It will help him to not be scared. Now, animals make catacombs. For example, the next slide just shows some dogs on leashes. When I'm on the leash, I protect, and when I'm off the leash, I can go play. They make catacombs. Horses will make catacombs. Um, if uh, cattle have just been worked by people on horses, they may be afraid of people on foot. Or you can have a horse, you can ride it, but then he's really bad about having the vet work on him or the farrier work on him because he had bad experiences with people on the ground. People on the ground are different than people on my back. And it can be either good or bad either way. The next slide shows sorting sensory-based information into categories in the brain. That is how I think. All of my thinking, I take specific examples and I put them into categories. It's what's called bottom-up thinking. And the next slide just shows that. It's also how artificial intelligence works. If you have a program that can diagnose melanoma cancer, you show it thousands of melanomas and it's able to pick out the melanomas from the bug bites and the other skin rashes. It's bottom-up not top-down. Verbal thinking is very top-down. 
I have people ask me questions as vague as, well, what do I do about dog behavior problems? Well, I don't, I got to know what the behavior problem is. And bottom up thinking in the next slide, animals do it, people with autism do it, and computers do it. That's the thing that's really interesting. The next slide shows a flight zone of a bunch of sheep. Now, if you have a completely tame animal, you got no flight zone at all. And uh, you're not gonna be able to drive them, but that shows the flight zone of some fairly wild sheep. The next slide just kind of shows how the flight zone works. I enter the flight zone and the black Angus move away. And the, there's a tan animal that's looking at me. He knows I'm there. And then he got some other cattle eating. They don't even know I'm there. So there's kind of like three zones. You enter the flight zone, there's a zone of awareness, they know I'm there. And then there's other cattle, I'm too far away. The next slide shows a very handy dandy little way to get cattle to move forward. Kind of counterintuitive. You walk back by them in the opposite direction of where you want them to go, and they go forward. Now I want to tell a little bit right now about how I got my business started. Because there's a lot of kids out there that are different that just aren't going anywhere. You know, they're labeled dyslexic, autistic, whatever. And I worked with a lot of people and I was out building things. The next slide shows my brochure for my business. And I was out building things and I worked with welders and drafting people that were either autistic, dyslexic, or ADHD. And they were brilliant. And one of the things that really helped them was a welding class in high school. One of the worst things they have done in the high schools is taking out the skilled trades class. Taking those classes out is a gigantic big mistake. And so when you're different, when you're kind of weird and different, I would show people my portfolio. I'd show the kind of work I could do. And then the next slide shows one of my drawings. And um, that's the drawing right there that I sold to Cargill Company. I, I used that drawing right there to, uh, I gave a copy of that to the head of Cargill. Next uh, slide just shows a picture of some of my facilities. And I basically learned when I started out to sell jobs by just showing what I could do. Okay, wait a minute. Somebody's got a question here. I think I'll go ahead and mention that COVID was good for dogs. I've never seen dogs get so much walking and dogs get so much attention because prior to COVID, there were a lot of dogs that were home alone and I could hear them whining inside the buildings and inside the houses. Um, now people are home and dogs are getting a lot of attention. I think dogs must think COVID's really a good thing. They don't know what it, is, what it really does to us, but I'm, I'm seeing so many dogs out being walked and stuff in, in a way that I never saw before. Okay, the next slide just talks about the importance of measuring. Um, that shows one of my facilities. Can't emphasize enough non-slip flooring. All right, let's see how good you are at visual thinking. Uh, I can't get anybody to raise their hand, but um, I want to ask how many of you saw that that animal was looking at the sunbeam? This is the sort of stuff I want people to see. He is looking at the sunbeam. When I show that to elementary school kids, over half the kids see it. I show it to mathematicians, almost nobody sees it. School administrators don't see it either. Highly verbal. Let's go to the next slide. Now, when I started out, I thought I could fix everything with equipment. Well, one of the things I found that helped the cattle handling the best was measuring it. Okay, so people go out and do a workshop on low stress cattle handling. They're all excited. Oh, we're gonna put the electric prods away. Um, uh, and, and then you come back a year later and they sort of have regressed back to bad because you need to measure it it's sort of like traffic on the highway if you didn't measure it. Now, somebody met, had a chat thing that came up about looking into the sun. I did show a slide of that. Um, one of the very first things that I ever did, I looked at time of day effects. And there were two identical working facilities in Arizona, one that worked well and one that worked badly. And the one that worked headed straight into the sun, it worked really badly. And then the next slide just shows the measurement system that is now part of the beef quality assurance. And you measure things, then you start to manage it. It's just that simple. These are actually good scores. When we first started out, electric pride use was on everything. You had a lot more cattle falling down. You start to measure it, 
then you start to improve things. And the next slide shows the results of the McDonald's audits. I'm really proud of this. Back in 1999, I worked with McDonald's on auditing meatpacking plants, and we made them fix stuff. And this graph just shows, uh, you know, the big improvements that we did. When you got a big customer insisting that they do things right. Now, in the last part of this presentation, before we go into the questions, that's the part I like the best, is genetics. The next slide shows from the very first research I ever did was on temperament in cattle. And we found that cattle that get scared, jump around and squeeze shoots when you're holding them, they have lower weight gain. People thought that was crazy. They just thought it was totally crazy to look at um, how much cattle jump around and squeeze shoots. Well, it turned out that they gained less weight. But on the other hand, you got to not overselect for temperament. Let's go to the next slide. Um, any trait, if you're breeding animals, dogs, cats, anything, you overselect for any single trait, <coughs> you will wreck your animal, period. Traits are linked. So let's say we just select for a bunch of dull head, super calm cattle. Maybe they won't take care of their calf. Maybe she'll attack you because she doesn't have any fear. No, you can get into trouble if you over-select. This is some work that my student did out on a ranch with Red Angus. Obviously, I don't want to keep the cow that walked off and left its calf. And the next slide shows a beautiful purebred Brahmin down in Australia. And uh, actually, Brahmins really like to be stroked. Here's a hint. Don't pat animals like to stroke them. Animals like to be stroked. They don't like to be patted. I've done a lot of work on animal welfare. And for farm animals. And the next slide just shows basic things you want to measure, like lameness, for example. Uh, in dairy cattle, they, in some places, they got into very high lameness because nobody measured it. And then when you asked people how many of a, your dairy cattle were lame, they underestimated it by 50%. Nope, you've got to measure stuff. Heat stress, if you've got cattle with the mouth open, open mouth breathing, they are too hot, period. Now, the thing is, I can't measure everything. So you got to figure out what are the relatively few things to measure. And I like to use traffic as an example. If I was only going to measure three things, I'd measure speeding, drunk driving, and stopping violations. Probably get 90% of my safety and I add texting and seat belts, I'd probably get 95% of the safety if I did that. Now, lameness is a good critical control point because the next slide shows uh, there's a lot of different things you can make a dairy cow lame. So I go in and I do an animal welfare audit. I, it's sort of a screening tool. And I go, yes, you got a lot of lame cows. Then you're going to have to get the managers and the veterinarians to come in and figure out what's wrong. And one of the things we've got to be careful about is leg confirmation. We can go to the next slide. This is in cattle. You can also get confirmation issues in horses. Um, but you just select for meat quality, uh, for just for meat traits, you tend to get leg confirmation issues. And there's a lot of problems in dogs, too. The next slide shows a steer with a leg that's way too straight. He's going to have lameness issues. The next slide shows a pig with a collapsed ankle. Very nice non-slip floor, but a really dreadful leg. And my next slide shows crooked claw, another defect. And I'm going to show now some foxes from an old ancient experiment that was done by a guy named Belia. On the next slide, and that's the original fox, a fur fox that really nasty, bites you real high strong, bites your head off. And for 20 generations, Belief selected for general foxes didn't bite, bite you. And look, let me show you what they ended up with. The next slide shows, how did you get from that lean, lanky fox that would bite you to this gentle dog-like animal? All they did is select for temperament. That shows you that traits are linked. And uh, then you overdo it. You might end up getting epilepsy on top of it. You don't want to do that. The next slide shows some tame deer down in New Zealand. 30 years ago, when I went to New Zealand, there's no way you could have gotten a pen like this for these deer. They would have been jumping all over you. Well, I want to end up now, and I got to bash the bulldog, because that's an animal that's been way too overselected for an appearance trait. The next slide shows what a bulldog used to look like. Now the next slide shows what it looks like now. Can't breathe, can't walk, can't have its babies. And then this next slide shows a 1938 bulldog. It's called Bulldog's Dilemma. You can look this picture up online. 
And the next slide shows a really hideous Arabian horse. It's nice to have a dish face, but this is overdoing it. And if you just go and type into Google Images Extreme Arabian Horse, you'll find this. I don't think this is pretty. This animal is going to have trouble breathing. I can't believe people are breeding some of these problems. And let's just look at what we've got to do when we assess animal welfare. And one of the things we need to be doing is you got to prevent suffering. And the next slide asks that. You've got to prevent suffering. But does that animal actually have positive emotions? Is it having a good life? And I'm going to, you know, put, you know, when the pets are home alone all the time, that's not necessarily a good life. And the next slide just shows my books. And then what I'd like to do now is I uh, go into questions and I want to do lots of questions. I got plenty of time for questions. We can get the slide side down and I uh, get the chat back up where I can see it. And okay, there's the thing about COVID right now. Um, we have some Hope we can have some questions. I'd... There's some questions in the Q and A. Um, the first one is, uh, "What is your favorite, or what was your favorite subject in school?" My favorite subject in school is biology. I loved biology, and my worst subject in school is algebra. It was just too abstract, but I loved biology, and I also loved art and making things. Someone else asked, um, could you give more detail on bottom-up thinking or possibly more examples because they're not sure that they've gotten their head around it? Okay, all right. Let's, um, um, let's just look. You could take anything. It takes a lot of information to do bottom-up thinking. And uh, let's go back to the melanoma example. So you show it pictures of you know, lesions that are melanoma. Then you show the computer mosquito bites, rashes, cuts, scabs, other things that are definitely not melanoma. So it sorts. When I was a child, the way I sorted cats from dogs was by size. Then our next door neighbor got a dachshund and the dachshund was the same size as a dog, as a cat. So now I had to find sensory based features that dachshunds share with dogs, such as barking, their smell, and the shape of their nose. Yeah, that, that's a very simple example there of bottom-up thinking. Hopefully that explains it, because that's the way autistic kids think. It's specific examples put into categories. Yeah, Show yeah. animals for confirmation showing animals for confirmation, I think we should be. Um, some of the steers that are putting in the shows now, if those were bulls, uh, you wouldn't be able to use them for breeding because they wouldn't hardly be able to walk because they've got bad leg confirmation. Um, fear and suffering, um, well, it's, it's how you raise them. And this is where stockmanship really matters. It matters. And people, it, and I've been talking about this for years, there's lots of research that shows how much stockmanship matters. The good stockmen aren't paid enough. It's not given enough credit. Now, the, the very interesting question here on the chat, it says, very intelligent people, big brains, the tendency for more mental health issues. Yes, that is correct. Because to make a big brain, when the fetus is growing, you've got to make a ton of stem cells. Stem cells have just got to grow. And there's lots of room for things to just get wired wrong. And genetics can't tell every brain cell where to go. Let's sort of use an analogy, a visual analogy. Let's say you got two identical Ford cars off the assembly line. Well, even though they came off the same assembly line, the exact same model, there might be little quirks because somebody left a pen inside a door panel or they didn't tighten some bolts up quite the same way. Well, a car is very simple compared to the brain. And, and uh, if you were to totally get rid of things like autism, uh, no, that'd be a great price for that. No, there is, there is a price for a big brain. A big brain is difficult to build. And the paper, if you want to look at that paper, it's called Genomic Trade-Offs. Genomic Trade-Offs 
are autism and schizophrenia, the steep price for a human brain. And I am happy to answer autism questions if people want to ask those too. Ooh, wait a minute. Religious education for kids with autism. I keep it just really simple, really basic. The golden rule, you know, I do treat others the way you'd want to be treated. And I'm remembering now the two wallets I returned at the airport. You know, was, one of them was a money clip and I was flipping around on the x-ray belt and I gave it back to the guards. Uh, but, you know, keep it really simple, really positive. You know, you can give the little bracelet say, what would Jesus do? Well, there's a lot of things he'd not do, bully people. Very simple, very, very positive. Um, let's see, wait a minute, I have a few friends Well, I think it, you see, the question was, is it harm to give religious instruction? It depends on how you do it. And you might want to read my book, Thinking in Pictures. I have a chapter on that. You might want to look at the last chapter in Thinking in Pictures. I discussed that. But all religions have a golden rule. And, and uh, that's a very good thing to be teaching. Okay, I'm looking at dolphins. Okay, the, the dolphins uh, being, their visual thinking is probably in sound. Because some blind people can actually learn to echolocate like a bat. And if a child is born blind, the entire visual cortex can get repurposed for auditory. And, and so a, a dolphin probably actually almost sees in sound. And in the autistic brain, I reviewed a study where they had blind people playing a, a game in a building and they learned to echolocate and find out where they were in this building and they, it was a building they'd never been in. And it's too bad that they don't teach blind people to echolocate because it makes them a lot more independent because that real estate up uh, that for the visual cortex, it's going to get reused, especially if the person's born blind. Um, the antelope, it took a long time to train it. For example, it took 10 days to teach it to tolerate the sliding door opening. The first day, I moved the door about this much and it orients like this. That's all we did that day. Next day, the door was moved two inches and it orients. Because see, when the animal orients, you've all seen deer look up. When it orients, then the brain's making a decision. Do I keep watching or do I throw a big fit right now? And you don't ever want to push that animal past that orienting stage. And they're very specific. The veterinarian who had shot them with a dart gun could never work with those antelope. And they tolerated people in front of the exhibit, behind the exhibit. But when roofers came, they went berserk and hit the fence. That was something new they had never seen. Well, one of the things I've done to help try to get people to accept animal welfare is show that you know, animals are more productive if you treat them well. Fear-free program, yes. I'm very, very familiar with Marty Becker. In fact, he invited me to come to the VMX meeting. He's going to have me go visit some vet clinics that are doing that. Hopefully, we can get that set up with COVID. Um, you know, people are beginning to realize that it really stresses an animal out. You know, just take the cat and just hold it down. I, uh, that really stresses it out. You know, the first thing you want to do is uh, prevent the fear of falling. Give it a non-slip floor to stand on. Support it when you hold it. See, sometimes the way it's handled, that's worse than the than a shot would be. Okay, somebody's asking here. Um, I mean, I'm just move this chat up. I'm. Uh, yeah, it did take a long time to train the zoo animal, but the advantage is that when the offspring of that animal was easy to train because the mom just trained it. It was easy to train it. But it made medical things so low stress because we um, collected cortisol samples from those antelope and they were almost at baseline. And when I went through all the cortisols that they had in the literature, they were horrible, high stress. You know, we got it down to single digits. And people had a hard time accepting that maybe when some of the stuff they were doing is just totally stressing an animal out. 
but that's getting a lot better now. Knowing you had autism, how did you know you could accomplish so much? Well, um, I'm seeing too many kids where autism is becoming their total identity. And they're not getting out and doing enough stuff. They aren't learning basic skills like shopping, just basic, basic skills that people need to learn. And we've got to, you've also got to get kids out and get them, well, it's getting dark in here, and get them, and get them exposed to stuff. I got interested in the cattle industry because I got exposed to it when I was 15 years old, when I went out to my aunt's ranch. The other thing for me to get into the cattle industry, I had, I learned how to drive. You got to learn how to drive, and it's going to take longer. I would go three miles up to my aunt's mailbox on dirt road, three miles back, I, I had to have a lot more practice before I, um, I, uh, before I did any traffic. That will solve the problem with the multitasking. It's getting really funky here in the dark. I'm not trying to write something. Okay, I think that's gonna look better. Okay, I just noticed that. Um, but those are things where I'm seeing kids where no, they need to get out and have some other interest. I've been out to Silicon Valley to the big tech companies. Half those programmers are on the spectrum. They tend to avoid the labels. And they make all the technology that we use. Okay, somebody asked, what was the aspect of working with animals found most interesting or useful? Well, when I first started, I thought everybody thought in pictures. I didn't know I thought differently. And then as I worked on doing some of my books and interviewing people, it was kind of a shocker to me to find out that there's people that didn't think in pictures. And then there's some that kind of think in pictures and verbal that have mixtures. But the first step is realizing that different ways of thinking can bring different skills to the table. And just in building a great big food processing plant, the mathematical engineers, they make the boilers in the refrigeration, but a really clever packaging machine that's made by people with my kind of mind. And right now they're getting screened out of it, things due to algebra requirements. Well, the other thing is work hard. I had some good mentors. I had very good science teacher who really encouraged me, gave me interesting projects to do. And there were some good people in the cattle industry too that helped me. They, there were some people that were, did bad things too, like putting bull testicles on my vehicle. But they were also the good people. Most of that bad stuff, it was the foreman level that did it. Being a woman was a much bigger barrier than autism ever was. Wait, we're getting more new messages. Fear free, we talked about on um, my own. Don't you know it by now? Learn by what's. Okay, I'm just trying to figure out this question. Uh, she's wondering about her own learning style. Well, the, my book, The Autistic Brain, I'll talk about the visual thinker like me, object visualizer, then the mathematical thinker. Um, if you wanna look up some of this research online on Google Scholar, you wanna use the terms object visualizer, that'd be me, and visual spatial, that's the mathematical mind. And, and then unfortunately, there's a lot of lit literature where they mix them together under visual spatial. And that's wrong. And it's like messed up a lot of studies. Now this is something, okay. Well, yeah, the alpha cat getting more stressed. Yeah, that could be it. He is used to be in control. He's not in control of the vet. Favorite animal? Well, I really like cattle. I, that's an animal that worked for a long time. negative cat behavior. Uh, the first thing you gotta do is make sure there isn't something medically wrong with the cat. That would be making it pee all the time. You gotta rule that out first. And if there's more than one cat in the house, put get separate cat boxes and get them away from each other. So each cat's got its place to go. Um, and don't put the cat box in Grand Central Station in the house. There's a lot more tips in Animals Make Us Human 
on cat and dog behavior problems. But the first thing you've got to do is make sure it doesn't have a urinary tract infection or something medically wrong. That has to be ruled out. Then you work on the behavior. Bullying. Only place that I was not bullied was where there was a shared interest. When I was in high school, I was called tape recorder because I'd say the same things over and over again. And I was called a uh, bones because I was skinny. And I, the kids that I rode horses with and we did model rockets with and we did electronics with, the, the bullies weren't there. Get a kid involved with shared interests. That's um, smart autistic kids that are nonverbal. Um, see if you can get them to type independently. There's, there's some of them that can. And you might want to read, uh, there's some really good books you can read that are written by individuals that are nonverbal uh, who type independently. And one of them is Tito Muckapadahe. How can I talk if my lips don't move? Tito Muckapadahe. How can I talk if my lips don't move? And the sequel to The Reason I Jump. And it's something like fall down five times, get up seven times. I can never remember the numbers, but it's the sequel to The Reason I Jump. And in both of these, they discuss a sensory disordered world, problems with controlling movement. There's also Carly's voice. And these are people who type independently without being touched, or, and the device is not being touched either. The keyboard is also not being touched. Uh, no, I, I, if they can just learn to type on a computer, that'd be great. Or on an iPad or something like that. Uh, we have to start looking at what they can do. What they can do. There's a tendency lots of times to not have enough expectations. And the other thing you need to do is you need to stretch. You don't chuck them into some situation where they're gonna get into total sensory overload, which would be completely horrible. Um, but they've got to go in a store and buy something. Cannot communicate. So you can sign a few symbols. Um, I, I think these books I just recommended hey, how can I talk? My lips don't move. And the, and the sequel to The Reason I Jump are really good things to read because it will give you an idea of what the world of a nonverbal person is like, written by a person who's nonverbal. Uh, now, was the movie realistic? The visual thinking was shown accurately. It showed how I think. The projects were all real and the main characters were real. Now, there's some stuff that kind of changed, like that wild horse that wasn't as crazy as that. I took some liberties with some stuff, but it showed autism accurately. It showed visual thinking accurately and it showed my projects and the main characters were very nicely shown. Stressing out cats when you need to collect them to go to the vet or travel. First of all, let's teach a cat when it's a kitten that the crate's a good place. And you're not just jamming them in a crate when you're gonna travel or go to the vet. And because unfortunately, too often it's like, okay, the cat's under the bed, you drag it out, shove it in the carrier. You know, and same thing with the dog. They can be trained that that's, that's a good place. And this brings up the whole issue of novelty, too. Um, how do you get kids to wear masks? Well, practice and let them pick out a mask. Give them some choices. Let them have some choices of masks. You're going to wear one, but you can pick out one you like or one you hate the least, and then practice wearing it. Now, there was just a case where a young autistic kid was thrown off of an airline for not wearing a mask, and the CEO of Southwest Airlines was on national television. No, but that's not something that you start doing the day you're going to go to the airport. The same thing with the cat. You know, no, don't let, let's, let's have it where the crate's a good place. That would help a lot. Do I have ticks or stems? Yep, I sometimes I'd like to doodle on things. Here's some of my doodling that I'll do. You know, mark on the paper like that. Use up a lot of, use a pen up just doing that. That's something I do. And the question is, how do you handle stimming? I was allowed to stim after lunch, you know, for a while, and then in other places it wasn't allowed. 
Now, kids will stim because it calms you down. But the problem is, if you let a kid stim all the time, then they shut the world out. Uh, sounds like, a, well, having an interesting career is extremely important for me. It's sort of like, you know, most people live to be social. I like solving problems. It makes me happy when a parent says to me, well, my kid got a job and now he got married and he has a house and things are going just great. I go, good. Or my kid took a shop class and, and now he's fixing cars for the railroad, fixing stuff for the railroad. There's been some good luck with kids that are addicted to video games with uh, changing that over to car mechanics. And there's a huge shortage of car mechanics. Skilled trades is visual thinking territory. Welding, carpentry, you know, all of those, those kinds of things. What do I do in my free time? I like to read. I'm a Star Trek fan. What do people with ASD need to be independent? Well, let's just start off with learning how to shop in the store. Learning how to manage a bank account. I mean, I was doing those things seven and eight years old. I was doing those things. Bank account came a little later, but shopping, that was being done really young. They've got to learn these things. I remember when mother made me go to the lumber yard by lumber month by myself. We were remodeling the kitchen and I was afraid to go. She made me go. I came back a little bit upset, but I found out I could deal with the clerks at the Weber's lumber yard. I'd... See, there's a tendency lots of times to overprotect dog and wolf emotions. The main difference is we bred the dog to be more socially needy. Where if you give a wolf a puzzle box to get something out of, he'll just go do it. The domestic dog will try a certain amount and then he's going to ask us to help him. You know, we've bred dogs to be friendly and hyper social. And, and that's why a lot of dogs have problems with being home alone. And there's actually quite a lot of literature on, on uh, dogs being home alone. Okay. Giftedness and autism. Yes. Uh, that goes together. You see, the thing is, how do you allocate resources in the brain? I can allocate resources more for um, thinking, or I can allocate resources for social. And, and uh, you put, take out some social circuits, and you've got circuits for like designing computers or doing artwork or some other thing. Uh, yeah high intelligence and autism do go together. You see, this is where traits are linked. And you see, it, you see going back to the lions compared to the panthers and the tigers, or bears are, are solitary, skunks are solitary. And then you've got animals that live together. Cattle would be one of them. Uh, they live in big social groups. Wilderbeest in Africa would be another one. They're very social. Well, I don't have any pets, and the reason I didn't is I was traveling all the time. And I, when this whole COVID thing started, I didn't think it was going to last as long as it did. Okay, looking up the visual thinker, the Google site I'm talking about is Scholar. Google Scholar takes you into the scientific literature. And so the find is really easy. You just go online, type Scholar into Google, click. You'll see a link that will say Google Scholar. You click on that brings up a new search box, and then you search the regular way, but now you get scientific papers, not all the other stuff. It's called Google Scholar. And if you go and want to look at some of the research on the different thinking, you can type object visualizer and visual spatial. You need to type in both terms, because if you just put in visual spatial, you're going to get a whole ton of papers where they mixed up the two kinds of thinking, unfortunately. I've just been reviewing this stuff in my new book and it's and, and kind of discouraging and mixed together because they don't realize that they're different. A lot of books on my desk. Well, I've got, um, well, I've got a bunch of things here. Uh, this is my book on uh, kids projects. 
These are things I made as a kid, calling all minds, stuff I made as a kid. Then I've got The Way I See It. That's my most basic autism book. I, I, a lot of little short chapters, I'm especially good for you know, parents who got a newly diagnosed autistic kid. That's a good book. And then I've got this Temple Grandin's Guide to Working with Farm Animals. Um, so I've got quite a few books. Okay, so we, how will they react when they got to be home alone again? That could be a problem. It actually be a good idea to start teaching the dog to gradually accept more time away from people rather than just suddenly take it away. The types of intelligences. Well, some of the things are similar. He has kinesthetic. Um, he's got more categories. But basically, you know, what I've seen, you've got the, you know, what the science is showing, you've got the object visualizer, you've got the mathematical mind, then you've got the verbal thinker. Now, other kinds of intelligence could be athletics, kind of kinesthetic. That, that's not, um, there definitely are differences in people's abilities and things like athletic. St okay, volunteering and internships, students inter interested in biology. Um, if you're in college, uh, I know things are really messed up now because it, everybody's online, but what people need to be doing is internships help up on research. I mean, even now we've got, um, uh, we got some experiments going on at our cattle and sheep experiment station, and they have students come out and help with those. Get involved with, um, people with research. I don't care what major you've got. Professors are doing research. Get involved in that. Get involved with doing internships. What's happened with internships with COVID at big corporations, they've ranged from horrible and canceled to rattling around in the big fancy corporate office with a CEO and having an internship with the CEO. So that's sort of what's happened to internships with COVID. They've ranged from wonderful to, and a lot of them dreadful because they were just canceled. Best for cat behavior, I would get, uh, for cat behavior, I would get the um, animals make us human. Okay, uh, nonverbal, uh, turn taking in games. This is one of the things that when I was a very young child, I, I was taught turn taking in games. You got to teach these kids how to wait and take turns. Really important thing to teach them. Also, if he's three years old and nonverbal, you know, the big issue now is how do you do therapy for a three year old online? It doesn't work very well. About the only thing a therapist can do is coach the mom how to do it. But you can't let these little three-year-olds just sit in, in um, they, you know, just sit off in a corner and just rock and stim. Um, no, you just can't do that. How did I pick CSU? Well, it was out in the West, and I knew a, a, a philosophy professor named Bernard Rollin, and I called him up, and it also was really good livestock industry state, and that's how I picked it. Star Trek episode, oh, well, I like a lot of them. I, I remember one Star Trek episode that really, in the classic Trek, that really made me think about emotions. And then this is in classic Trek, and they'd taken their shuttlecraft down to a planet, and one of the crew members had died. And the other crew members wanted to get the body and bring it back to the ship. Meanwhile, a monster's trying to smash up the shuttlecraft. Spock's going, we got to go, we got to go, we got to go. And he's the super logical one. But they got to go out there and get the body while the monster's like breaking the shuttlecraft. Well, you see, that's the social versus the logical. Do I have siblings? Yes, I've got two younger sisters and a brother. My brother's just retired from banking. Uh, now he's uh, buying houses and fixing them up and then reselling them because he likes to build things because he, he doesn't want to just sit around at home. And then one of my sisters, she's selling real estate. That's kind of slowed down. And my other sister's doing, doing some artwork. And then we do a family Zoom call every Sunday. We do that. Uh, yep, siblings. 
one of the things that my mother talks about in her talks where they you got to make sure parents don't just give the autistic kids so much attention that they um the siblings get left out it's really important for the siblings to get quality uh, quality time alternatives to my squeeze shoot yes there's i uh, uh, some kids like weighted vests, weighted blankets. Um, some kids like swinging. The thing is, on a lot of these sensory things, it's not one size fits all. It is definitely not. Types of things made me happiest. When I was a young child, I loved kites. Absolutely loved them. I loved to go out and fly kites. I loved to go fly glider, little glider planes and things like that. Love it flew. I loved it. I'm using service animals. For some kids, it's just great. Um, what I have found with dogs, there's kind of three ways that these kids react to animals. Love them, scared at first, and then they love them. And then you have a few kids where the animal is not appropriate because they, they're afraid it's going to bark and hurt their ears or they don't like the smell. Now, one of the ways to get kids over sounds they don't like and I can't control the dog barking, but I could have a recording device with that that the kid could control. Let's say you take something like the vacuum cleaner and the kid's terrified of it, then um, let that kid turn it on and off. Let that kid play with the vacuum cleaner where they turn it on and off. That's the thing to do. And then they might get to liking it when they can control that sound. Work with sheep, um, yep, I've done some stuff with sheep. They flock more than cattle, They're actually easier to handle than cattle. Someone thanked me for Google Scholar. Um, favorite animal, uh, what I like to do with cattle is I go out and lay down in the middle of the pasture and then they just all stand around me. And those scenes in the movie where Claire Dane just laid down there, that actually happened. Now I'd recommend putting your hands like this. The cow did step on her hand. Put your hands in. Also don't do that with bulls and don't do it in a confined space. It has to be in a big enough place so if something scared them, they can just move away. 21-year-old son. And um, hopefully he's had some work experience. Because I'm seeing a lot of kids that do really well academically, but they just have not had any work experience. And, we, and there's a tendency for some parents to not want to let go. Now, right now, a lot of the opportunities for volunteer jobs are shut down. Things like church volunteer jobs. Because these kids have got to learn how to do a task on a schedule outside the family. They've got to learn that. I live on my own. Well, I went to boarding school when I was 15, when I was um, 14 years old. So that helped me living away from home. Um, then I would, you know, then I was away at college. See, that actually helped because I, you know, wasn't living at home. Uh, great advice, teaching independence, shared interests, uh, living completely on my own I, when I got out to graduate school. I was still in touch with my old, old roommate. Well, I got in touch with her right after the movie. She'd retired. And um, what did mother do right? Mother had a really good sense of just how much to stretch me, just outside my comfort zone. Not chuck me into something where I'd get completely overwhelmed and I wouldn't be able to do it. She had just a really good sense about that. Um, she always gave me choices. After I got kicked out of ninth grade for fighting, as a girl called me a retard and I chucked a book at her, a mother picked out three special schools and she gave me a choice. It was always a choice. I had a choice of going to the ranch for a week or going to the ranch all summer. Not going wasn't one of the choices. Okay, what's your favorite animal? Okay, that we've just talked about. Thunder shirts. Um, the, uh, yeah, you wouldn't want to leave it on there you know, leave it on there too long or too tight. Well, the main thing is, you, you see, the thunder shirt, I mean, once you find out how your dog reacts to it, you know, if he's trying to chew it off and it's tangled up in it, then 
yeah, that could be a problem. The other thing, what's happening with a lot of disability stuff is I have people say, so how do we get jobs for people with disabilities? You know, lumping wheelchair, blind, to, in together with autism. Well, they require very different skills. And, and um, like I went to a disability conference and there was this very articulate blind man that got turned down for 20 call center jobs that he was totally qualified for. And when I think they were going about it wrong, I think he should have gone in there and said to that HR person, yeah, you're scared to get me. You're afraid that the accommodations are gonna to be too hard. I'll give you a two week free trial. And there's only one accommodation you gotta do. You gotta put the software on my computer. My friend will come in, set up everything else. Just give me a two week free trial. Bet you would have gotten the job. Because I, I've been on the corporate side of things and I can just say that HR person freaking out that it's just gonna to be too hard. Well, I had a blind roommate, so I know it's not hard. And and uh, if they'd gone in with that attitude, I'll have my friend come teach my dog the office layout. Uh, sources on epilepsy. Um, that's something where you can, uh, some of that stuff you wanna look up on Google Scholar. I do have some information on medications. I'm on antidepressant medications. I've been on them since my early 30s. And I describe my experiences with anti antidepressants for anxiety in my book, um, Thinking in Pictures. And even though that's 25 years old, it is still accurate. Uh, the mistake that gets made with antidepressants for anxiety is uh, too high a dose. And then you're gonna get agitation and insomnia. And then for some of the things with epilepsy, this is where you hit Google Scholar. And uh, you have to use the chemical names for drugs. Kepra is a brand name. So you go on regular Google, you'll look it up, find out what the chemical name is. Because when you're searching scientific papers, you have to use the chemical name of a drug, not the brand name. And, and the bar, phenobarbital is spelled wrong. You know, that's another thing you need to be doing is, is, uh, is, is look it up on regular Google, not to spell it, the chemical name. Do I still use the squeeze machine? No, I don't. Um, you did it, oh good, somebody did a two week free trial with their kidneys hired. Let me just get another drink of water here. Be right back. Uh, one of the problems I have with an antidepressant is I have to drink quite a lot of water. Well, good. And maybe they could type in and maybe Sally Carlson could type in and tell me what the, what the job was he's doing. That's just wonderful, wonderful. Well, you can train dogs, you know, gestures and dogs do learn verbal commands just fine. Uh, and, you know, do I have any house pets? Uh, repetitive thoughts and talking. I used to tell the same stories over and over again. So I had to have a rule. I can, when I was in high school, I drove the other kids crazy, talking on and on and on about carnival rides. Well, you've got to learn automotive detailing. Good. Well, that's be the perfect job and they probably love them. Oh, he was the best for the job in automotive detailing. And that's not going to go away people are still gonna to need to have their cars detailed. That's not gonna go away. That's a great job. Can I butt in with the question? Yeah, sure. um, would you talk more about the, uh, I'm sorry, it's getting really dark in here too, <laughs> too but would you I talk- light on. I didn't have the light on. I gotta do that. Um, talk more about schools cutting uh, programs that sort of filter into trade. I careers. think it's the worst thing schools have ever done. And the other thing I'm gonna be writing about in my uh, visual thinking book, We've lost skills. We don't build a poultry plant anymore. That gets shipped over here in a hundred shipping containers. We don't make elevators. And we also don't make the state of the art electronic chip making machine. The heart of your phone. State of the art, it comes from Holland. And I found a picture of that machine in the Economist magazine. And it looks like it's got some skilled trades in it. See, there's two parts of engineering. There's the visual thinking side and the mathematical side. And I was just looking up engineering curriculums because I'm working on the book and Betsy, my editor said, all right, so I looked up bachelor's degree in industrial design. That's more like what I would do. And a bachelor's degree in engineering, looking at these curriculums and the math, the uh, engineering ones are all math totally. And the industrial design is all the art. And the thing is, 
they both need to get together because it, you need to have both. Recommend for a minimally verbal eight-year-old boy on, and there's a lot of questions come up about ABA. The thing is, there's a lot of different kinds of ABA from old fashioned rigid ABA, which I don't like, and some of the more modern stuff where they combine it with sensory. If something's working, if you've done something four and a half years and it doesn't work, you need to try something else. Okay, an eight-year-old nonverbal boy, I wanna make sure he can do his basic skills, dressing, showering, just basic skills, can he do that? Uh, maybe you need, sometimes it's different teacher. I find that some teachers have the knack on working with these kids and some don't. See, a good teacher has to know just how much to push without driving them into sensory overload. Cheer me up when I'm in a bad mood. Oh, I can get the giggles over some really, really, really stupid things. Um, like my nephew's first industrial design project. It was codenamed. One was codenamed briefcase. The other was codenamed computer bag. And there was the Modco shape potty. I'm not kidding. It, they no longer sell it on Amazon. But it's kind of a thing that looks like a computer bag that opens up like this. And it's for your dog in some high rise apartment in New York to go potty on. Modco shape potty. And so then when someone says the word computer bag, why am I laughing? <laughs> about computer bag. Well, I think of that. And that actually is a real project he actually did when he got out of college. He even went to the factory in China to see how it was made. Did the whole thing. Um, okay, that's the, the different intelligences. Yeah, we talked about that. I'm, I have three. Um, you, see, you see how he may be putting musical in as a separate thing. Music often goes together with math. But uh, the music could be a separate, a, a separate skill. The thing that we need to be doing is, is figuring out what, let's figure out what somebody is good at and, 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 and enhance that. Okay, somebody diagnosed with autism. Um, Einstein had autism. Edison probably had autism. Michelangelo may have had autism. Steve Jobs may have had it. And then you might want to look up Bill Gates' antitrust depositions on YouTube. I'll let you make your own decision about those depositions. They're real interesting. And there's some other people testifying in Congress. You might want to look up their depositions. Yeah, people with autism run in Fortune 500 companies. It's, it's, uh, they, when I was three, I looked very severe. You can have young kids that look extremely severe and they get good early intervention, which I got, then you can kind of start to pull them out of it. Music therapy, I mean, for some kids, it, it works really well. I mean, but you've got to, with the little ones, with the real little kids, I want to work on getting speech going and turn taking. Real little kids, I want to see if I can get them to talk and they got to learn how to take turns. I had a lot of emphasis on that. And then they got to learn basic skills, dressing, potty, uh, showering, basic skills. Okay, that's very nice thing. Um, but there's some pretty famous people that were autistic. I worked with people out in construction, welding people, drafting people that were dyslexic, autistic, or ADHD. And there's a lot of genetic crossover with autism and ADHD. They're about 30% the same. That's why doctors mix them up all the time. Also, a diagnosis is not precise. Okay, if you get a decent COVID test, it will tell you whether you have it or not. It is a definitive test as long as it's a high quality COVID test. There's some rubbish out there. Uh, tuberculosis test, that's a definitive diagnosis. Autism is not like that, it's a behavioral profile. And they keep changing the behavioral profile. It's half science and half doctors renting conference rooms and hotels and arguing over it. That's what they did before COVID. 
Okay, that's we got one other message on here. Um, thanks so much, Chris, for your nice uh, comment on my presentation. I really appreciate that. Um, vaccinations, I don't want to talk about. It's too controversial. Okay, I have another button question, if you don't mind. Um, I had a, a patron uh, call, and she and I have had a relationship for a while, and she's uh, one of our one of our most loyal patrons, and she has a son, um, and he, um, I'm not exactly sure what his diagnosis is, but he found the library to be a place where he could be really social, and he, you know, he Good. had a community Good. space, which was great, um, but now with COVID, he's not comfortable going out in public spaces. Do you maybe you wouldn't know because everything's so new, but anything he could do, because his mom said he's really regressed, um, ways that he can reach out and be social. And Well, what were some of the things he'd like to do in the library? He played cards with a friend in our library. Maybe they can play an online card game. Okay. Why don't you try that? The same friend, and we'll play okay. it online. Like, I just was talking to somebody the other day that uh, their loved one's in a nursing home and locked up. Yeah. And they're playing some game, I think it's called Uker or something like that, mm -hmm. some card game. Mm -hmm. And they were playing it with their 90-something-year-old uh, mom that was in a nursing home. And that she loved to do it. But why don't we just try doing some of those same things with those same friends online? I know it's not exactly the same, but it's better than not doing it. And it has those positive associations already, like you talked about. I would about. try that. What card game was it they played? I don't know. I think it was Uno. I'll have to ask. Well, they probably have probably there's probably ways to do that online. I'm sure there are. Google and type in online Uno. Yeah. And or you can play it and hold the cards up to the camera. Oh and yeah. Figure out a way to do it. Like this morning, they sent me this um, pictures of the handling of pigs on some crazy website. I didn't want to open the file. It was too scary. Mm -hmm. So you know what we ended up doing? We ended up taking a phone. And putting it up like the, up to the camera like this, uh -huh. and um, and that's how we did the we did the. Um, I looked at the videos. So it was one very good, but I was able to see what I needed to see. Uh -huh. That's a low tech thing to do. Yeah, <laughs> just gonna be creative. That's what I did because we I didn't want to. They had it was it wasn't on Dropbox. It was on something really weird, and I didn't want to open the file. It just too scary for me. Yeah. Um, a word of hope that you can give to families We're diagnosed with often music therapy. We discussed that. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much. I um, wish we could do more accepting of neurodiversity. Well, you need neurodiversity. Okay, let's just talk about crop science. Monoculture is not a good thing. What they're learning in things like pasture rotation and things now is neurodiverse crops down here in my gut it's good to have some neurodiverse some uh, biological diversity in the rainforest you want to have you know biological diversity and different kinds of minds complement each other going back to the processing plant the mac petitions do the boilers and the refrigeration power and water us visual thinkers make all the clever equipment which we now have to import from holland and germany because we took skilled trades out um, okay, someone has boardgamearena.com. That sounds like a good website, Board Game Arena. Um, I make note of that. Thank you. Okay, they. Uh, now, the thing is, we got to get more creative on finding resources just in the, in, in the neighborhood. Like I've got, I got to go out and do a walk around my neighborhood every day or my back hurts. And, you know, I'm getting to meet some new people and we've got, there's one, there's three families next door that are sort of formed a quarantine pod and they have their little boys get together and play with scooters. So then those kids are going to get some socialization, you know, you know, find other families, you know, that aren't partying, they aren't doing things to bring COVID in. And, and what some families have done is they set up a little school where like Monday, one family runs it. Tuesday, another family runs it. And it's just three families just doing it, using the materials they get from the school. 
This is just doing things in the neighborhood. I've seen families get together, not huge parties. No, they're, they're, it'll be like two families that are really careful and have a plastic wading pool out in the lawn and kids are splashing around in it, having just a wonderful time. The other thing I think we need to be doing is tapping into retirees. You know, eventually this COVID thing's gonna get over. I can tell you right now, I will be taking the COVID vaccine. That's one vaccine. I'll discuss that, I will be taking. But I'll be researching it on Google Scholar because I wanna pick the, I wanna use a vaccine that's gonna work. And um, one of the problems with older people is they don't have as good a response to a vaccine. But yeah, I'd like to go back on the airplane again. I look at all the convention badges I've got, all the meetings I've been to, and I'm going, am I ever gonna wear a convention badge again? Convention center? Airport? I don't know what that is anymore. Will I ever get to do that again? Totally wild. It's a brave new world. Now let's see, we got two more messages. Oh, thank you for all the nice uh, comments. Really appreciate that. I'm glad we were able to, uh, but you need to have different kinds of minds doing things. But the first step you've got to realize is how they think differently. Like I'm working right now with Betsy on my book and Betsy's like a total verbal thinker. And, and then I get her edits back and wait a minute, I go, Betsy didn't understand that. Well, I've got to make it so Betsy understands it. You see, that's part of, uh, you see, I'm, we're fully aware of how different we are in our minds, but I think that's gonna make a really good book because our skills complement each other. You see, where before people would just fight. You know, the artists and accountants hate each other's guts, but there's a place for both. You know, we've gotta get hands-on stuff back in the schools and I'm seeing 16 year olds that are still building things with Legos because nobody thought to introduce tools. I was using tools when I was in second and third grade. Saw came at little saw at fifth grade. Hammer, screwdriver, and pliers in second and third grade. And we were taught how to use them safely. And then second grade, I could cut coat hangers. So it was really hard. I do, and then I go, that's how I cut coat hangers. But I was doing that at a very young age. I'm just going to butt in one more time and okay. say thank you so much <laughs> for doing this. It was wonderful. I learned so much. And I did want to ask one librarian question before we wrap up, if there aren't any other questions that you want to answer in the chat. Um, is what are you reading? And do you have any book recommendations just for pleasure reading for us? Well, I, I got asked to, to um, um, ask about books that I read as a child. And one that was, I really was into Black Beauty as a child. Another one of my favorite books as a child was about famous inventors. I absolutely loved reading about famous inventors. Mm -hmm. And some of them, they, were, they weren't the stellar students in school either. Thomas Edison would be a good example. I love to read about new technology stuff. I find that's really interesting. You know, my idea of fun reading, now I can see I've scribbled all over my science magazine. <laughs> but this is like my little dinner reading. I gotta go out and pick up the mail. I just got a new nature I gotta get into. Mm -hmm. I like reading that kind of stuff. That's, that's great. Stuff that, that I find real, real interesting. I also just really like doing these, the question and answer part of this, where hopefully I can help out some families, just think up practical ways to make things better. Well, thank you so much. And you're so generous with all the questions. And I know I learned a lot. I'm sure everyone else did too. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. And I, I guess it'll be about time to sign off now, but I really enjoyed being here virtually uh, tonight. And I'm, I'm just seeing some very nice thank yous on the chat. I really, really appreciate that. And I'm, I'm at three new messages. Okay, well, it was really great <laughs> to be here. Uh, even though thank it's you so much. virtual, but I guess I'll sign off now. All right, thank uh, you. Thank you so much. Thank you, have a good night. I will. Okay, yeah, bye. Bye-bye. Goodbye.